these are the uh, the uh, parts for the BPM5 uh, liquid rocket engine that we are currently producing at Copenhagen Suborbsons. Um, if we go to go over them piece by piece, the uh, the top piece here is what we call the LOX dome, and this is simply to inject liquid oxygen into the combustion chamber, or sorry, into the uh, uh, into the injector phase. So uh, we feed liquid oxygen through a port. Uh, we have a pressure port on the other side to record the uh, the, the inflow pressure of liquid oxygen. And the, uh, the, uh, the liquid oxygen then exits from these, uh, these holes at the bottom of, of the dome. Um, they go into uh, the, uh, the top flange, uh, as seen here. And uh, in this flange will sit the, uh, the monolithic injector that presently isn't, isn't completed. But the, the, the liquid oxygen uh, exits these fairly large holes and, and goes into the top of this injector uh, cup shape and is then uh, piped into the combustion chamber through a series of very small channels, 0.9 millimeter channels, through that injector plate. In between the, uh, the LOX dome and the injector plate, we also have a, a, uh, a strainer filter. And this is placed here simply to, uh, to take out any um, foreign objects that might be in the LOX tanks. Uh, or in, in, the, in the piping. And the, the issue here is, of course, that as the injector uses so, so tiny holes, uh, 0 0.9 millimeter in diameters, uh, it, it's fairly sensitive to, to plugging from, from smaller objects. And um, in essence, just plugging a single hole can be detrimental to an engine of this type, as you might end up with a, a, a complete skewing of, uh, of the mixed ratios near the chamber wall or any other precision that might actually damage the engine or, or cause a burn through. So, so the filter parts are fairly important in this regard. Um, the, uh, the top flange here is a, a steel, uh, a stainless steel object, and it, uh, it consists of simply a, a ring of, of holes at the perimeter uh, through which the, uh, the, the fuel is entering the chamber. So if you remember the, uh, the injector plate, it has uh, uh, liquid, oxygen, liquid, liquid oxygen going through the, uh, the holes along the longitudinal axis into the chamber. And the fuel enters from the side of, uh, into the injector plate, and then it goes through a series of radial channels into the injector plate, and then is sort of diverged 90 degrees into the chamber as well. So the, uh, the, uh, the fuel flows this is uh, the inner chamber tube, so the fuel flows on the outside of this into this small recess here, and then goes through this 90 degree bend to exit these holes, and then into the injector plate, and then back down into the combustion chamber. This, of course, uh, means that, uh, as you can see, there are quite a number of twists and turns in the path of the, uh, of the fuel in, in, in the engine. And this means that you will see a considerable pressure drop uh, going from, from the tank pressure to the combustion chamber pressure. Uh, this is, of course, something you would want to minimize because it means you would have to use larger pressures in your tanks, and larger pressures means heavier tanks. So um, if you look at this part, you will notice that this has a slightly larger diameter than the other one. This is the outer skin of the, uh, of the rocket engine, um, or the, the, the chamber liner, or outer liner, so to speak. And this go in, will, in fact, be cut into two along this axis, and then welded together on the outside of this chamber. To form the, uh, the correct spacing between the two chambers, we use two millimeter copper wire that simply is soldered onto the inner chamber. Uh, and this then provides the, the correct spacing. I have another engine over here. Simply we put these in to, to inundate the, the, uh, the concept of keeping those spaced uh, adequately. And, and the, the, the concept is, of course, we want to make sure that we have a fixed and uh, well-established spacing between the two walls so to give the uh, uh, the, the best possible uh, constriction of the flow volume on, uh, on the outside of the inner chamber. To 
to get the fuel into this volume uh, in between the two uh, engine cylinders, we will be uh, using a manifold which will be welded to the outer rim of the uh, the outer liner of the engine. So this this is one of these manifolds. It will be cut di diagonally and then welded together on the outside here. The fuel will enter the manifold through a, a pipe that goes along the side of the engine and the, the, uh, the fuel will then swirl around in this volume and then be directed up uh, in, the, in the spacing between the two chambers. And the flow will be directed by these uh, copper spaces as well. These, these uh, spaces are going to go along the longitudinal axis and then it's going to do a, a small twist at the end, sort of just to direct the flow in the, in the axial direction. Um, if one wants to add another remark to these spaces, uh, the concept is um, that you, you can use these spaces to control the flow velocity in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the cooling channel. And there are way, many ways to do this. One way could be, as we've done here, simply to make it uh, along the uh, longitudinal axis, which will give you a, a fairly low flow velocity, but in, in a sense that uh, the flow will be uh, non-turbulent over the, the largest part of the volume. Another option would be if you need more cooling capacity or you want to harness more of the cooling capacity of your fuel, you could do a spiral that goes around the uh, inner chamber and that will increase the flow uh, velocity, but also the, uh, the, day, the distance traveled by, by the flow as it goes from, from the manifold and into the injector and into the engine. And this means that it'll, it'll readily absorb more energy from the, the combustion chamber itself. Uh, this can have an advantage in the sense that you harness more of the, uh, of the uh, heat capacity of, of your fuel but it could also have the disadvantage that you get closer to the boiling point of the fuel at that given pressure, the operating pressure. Uh, so this is a trade-off you can do. Uh, essentially, it's a parameter we can adjust later on if we feel that we are operating marginally in terms of, of uh, thermal conditions. We can add, uh, we can change the, the format of these spaces to better implement cooling in, in any part of this volume. You, you could imagine a, a scenario where uh, around the, uh, the throat of the engine, you, you, you will see the largest heat flux from the combustion going through the, uh, the, the inner liner. So you could envision a scenario where you want to increase the, uh, the cooling capacity at that particular point, and that can be done by, by changing the, the, ge the geometry of these spaces. So this is one of the features of this engine. Essentially, this allows us to better tailor the, uh, the thermal response of the unit. So here we have one of the uh, main valves for the BPM5 engine. We have uh, two main valves, one for liquid oxygen and one for the alcohol uh, fuel mixture. And uh, as you may remember from previous tests in Copenhagen of Subautos, well, all of the engines uh, have been operating with a, uh, a pre-stage, main stage uh, uh, architecture. And uh, the idea has been that uh, you open a pre-stage valve to get a slight flow into the engine, and then you ignite that flow uh, to uh, ensure a complete ignition prior to actually opening the main valves and then starting the engine at full thrust. And that concept can be used to, to sort of ensure that uh, you have a stable ignition source present in the chamber prior to uh, actually firing up the engine at full throttle. And in essence, that's done to make sure you minimize the risk of a hard start. Um, presently, uh, that configuration required two valves for fuel and two valves for oxygen, or for liquid oxygen. So, so that, that's uh, a, a weight and, a, shall we say, complexity challenge. Uh, for the BPM-5 engine, we've chosen a slightly different strategy in that regard. We have chosen to do a single valve solution but a valve, uh, rather than the, the previous setups, which have used pressurized air to simply move the, uh, the valve from, from closed to fully open, uh, we have now a, a, a electrically uh, actuated, uh, electric motor actuated valve instead that allows us to um, move the, uh, the, the opening degree or the degree of opening in the valve with quite a bit of a higher precision. 
So in essence, we are now using a valve with a cross section like this. So it's not a straight hole anymore. And this means that when you rotate that valve inside the, uh, uh, the, this ball inside the valve, you'll be able to open a very slight flow at the beginning. And then you can open it fully to get a full flow through the valve. And this means that we can actually do the pre-stage, uh, main stage architecture with a single valve. And we have full control over the mixture ratios between the liquid oxygen and the fuel as the burn goes on. And this means we have a whole new set of options in terms of, of driving the, uh, the motor at the correct operating point all the way through the burn. We don't have to accept that the point of optimality will only be at, at one point. We, we can sort of trim this as we go along to, to uh, sort of correct for the uh, autogenous, uh, autogenous pressurization of uh, liquid oxygen once the tank is depleting. So that's, that's a whole new option for, for Copenhagen's motors. Thank you.